So uh, let's get an intro to the speakers and uh, some uh, moment to share your stories uh, on academic and enterprise collaborations. So, Dave. Thank you. Well, now I'm all by myself. I'm the University of Oswell person, but hopefully there's no real gap here. In fact, we're talking about how to bridge the gap, right? Uh, and Claire, I think our official title for her is Fearless Leader of Curious, so we'll go with that. Uh, I'm, I'm Saeed Chaudhry. I lead the Open Source Programs Office at Carnegie Mellon University, which is a member of Curious. Uh, I've been there just over two years at this point. Prior to that, I used to be at Johns Hopkins, where I started the OSPO there as well, uh, which was the first in a U.S. research university. And uh, for the purposes of today, I just want to make a, a couple of points from the university perspective. Um, obviously, I don't represent all universities, but I, I think they're fairly typical across the U.S. landscape. And it is the U.S. landscape, so I'm very curious to hear about, you know, particularly from John, the perspective of European um, technology transfer. But in the U.S., uh, technology transfer offices are typically the way in which universities and industry have interacted with each other. Uh, but what is interesting is the OSPO is now becoming another way in which the researchers and the faculty and the students are thinking about we can work w with industry. And there's a couple of important points that I want to raise around that. One is that there are obvious differences between academia and industry. One of them, I think, uh, and this is actually not my observation, it's Dwayne O'Brien, who some of you may know. Uh, we've been working with him for, for a few, few years at this point. He said, you know, I, I now realize that universities have large numbers of small projects. Um, you, you have projects ranging from one person, <laughs> literally, um, to typically no more than maybe half a dozen, right? So uh, a faculty advisor and that faculty advisor's graduate students typically is the team that's working on a project. And anyone in a university can spin up an open source project. There, there's, there's no formal process, there's no approval, there's nothing. Uh, if a faculty member wishes to start one up with or without a grant, uh, they, they can do so. And in fact, they're encouraged to do so. So there's a tremendous opportunity there, of course, um, but there's a tremendous uh, <laughs> heterogeneity or diversity or whatever the right word is. And I think that needs to be accounted for. But, but even with that, here are a few trends that you know, we're starting to see from the OSPO perspective. Uh, one is I'm hearing more faculty say, yeah, I, I'll go to tech transfer if I want to create a commercial product around my open source pro my project and then have a company uh, that basically sells that product. But I want to think about different ways in which I can engage with industry. And some of those may still involve, you know, the exchange of resources, financial or not. Uh, but what if we don't want that to eventually end up with that model of a company with a product? And one of the main drivers for that actually is governance. So faculty will often take a year of absence uh, leave in, in the United States to launch a company, but they almost always come back. It's rare that they want to run the company. They don't want to be the CEO of the company that's been formed, but they still want influence. <laughs> and rightly or wrongly, rightly or wrongly, they still want influence and rightly or wrongly, they view a company as losing that influence. So we're getting these questions around, can we still have commercialization, but the governance remains with me as a faculty member, even after that happens. And then the second category is not necessarily about flow of resources, but actual collaboration around the research, right? And I know in our planning call, we, we talked about this a lot, but I'll just mention some of the ideas that came up. Uh, one is, are you going to use a contributor license agreement? Are you going to use a developer certificate out of origin? I take a lot of pride in having worked in universities for a long time and figuring out the very sort of bizarre ways that you get things done uh, in a university. I'm fairly confident it's impossible to sign a CLA for the whole university. Uh, if someone can do that, I'll be very impressed, uh, partially because there are large numbers of small projects. You're, you're going to literally have to talk to hundreds of different projects and try to make that happen. So what's a more frictionless way for that to happen is really important. Um, and then and the, the last thing I'll say is the academic freedom component. So if they're going to be joint research projects, the faculty will absolutely insist on the publication rights. Uh, on certain, you know, understanding about how the outputs get shared, even if they ultimately end up with a different IP regime or as commercialization, the initial idea is that they need to be open. Uh, so I'll just put those out there as, you know, one perspective from the university 
um, you know, viewpoint, but I'd love to, of course, hear from the panelists and all of you. Thanks, Saeed. Yeah, I'm very conscious of our time, so I'll try to be quick, but I'm delighted that you're all here when the bar in the park is going to be open. Um, no, it's, it's through Saeed that I was working in knowledge transfer. In, in Europe, we kind of call it knowledge transfer rather than technology transfer because that it's not always technology, you know, it keeps the humanities people and the arts people, you know, involved. But uh, it was Saeed that, through Claire, that we heard had set up an open source program office in Johns, Johns Hopkins, not John Hopkins. And it was just struck me that we were doing it in Trinity College, a university in Dublin, we were doing the same thing and we had been doing it. So we did all the spin out stuff and we'd spun out companies that we allowed open source, which kind of was kind of against the principle of traditional technology transfer. But it's all about freedom. You know, you, you use the word, you know, open source is about freedom. Academia is about freedom. So you have academic freedom, op open source, but we're kind of caught in the middle and we're trying to navigate and educate, educate, you know, what can you do if you're a researcher? And you're so right, it's all about um, multiple small projects, some bigger, some small, as my old boss used to describe it. I don't know if you have the concept in, in, in Britain and Ireland, I don't know in Europe, if you, the concept for, of a sole trader. You know, if you're a plumber or you're a bricklayer, you don't have to form a company, you can be a sole trader and just make your tax return every year. So my boss said, universities, Trinity was full of 1,200 sole traders. And it's a lonely life, they're working together, you know, in their small groups, they're competing with the people down next door. We never talk to that lab. We don't like what they did 20 years ago, but, but, anyway, but open source is hugely valuable in when it comes to collaboration. That's the key point that I just thought I'd like to say. Because when you learn about intellectual property, boring intellectual property, when you work in technology or knowledge transfer, joint owned, jointly owned IP is the most difficult thing. And everybody shies away from it. And we've got a government protocol in Ireland that says the university owns all the IP in the beginning, which is the best way to do it. So open source gets rid of all that hassle about jointly owned IP. Everybody owns it, the world owns it. But the caveat is always in our job, as open as possible, you know what I'm gonna say, and as closed as necessary. Sometimes it has to be closed. You know, it's funded by a company, it's funded by an agency, it's developing a drug and millions and millions and hundreds of millions of research has gone into do this and they need a return. So that's kind of just in a nutshell, the, the kind of points that, that we have. Thank you. For, so, for those who don't know me, I'm Jonas van der Bogart. I work as open source office lead at Aliander, a grid operator in the Netherlands. And also uh, one, uh, we are a member of the Tudor group. And I'm really happy to see that not only in enterprises like Aliander, but also Cisco and many others, that open source is, is strategically getting more important, especially in the role it plays in innovation and R&D. And also, I'm really happy to see that also more academia and universities recognize the importance of open source in the role of innovation and R&D. And I want to take up the point you are making, huh, that the role open source plays in collaboration. And I think it plays a very important role. Uh, we see in the collaborations uh, we have uh, as Aliendo with several universities, uh, among them uh, TU Eindhoven, TU Delft, leading universities in the Netherlands, is that taking an open source and an open access approach to our research activities helps, helps uh, on one side the university that they can use the products and software we develop in, in the industry yeah, because the models, uh, open source models that are developed in the industry can also be used uh, by, by the researchers, by the PhD students, without them going to uh, time consuming contract declarations, high costs and vice versa. But also the other way around, yeah, uh, taking a more open source 
approach or an open access approach in research enables us to take a more easy benefit of the outcomes of the research uh, we invest in and to adopt it and implement it internally and continue the uh, evolution of these projects uh, in, in, uh, to make it enterprise ready. And I think this is also one of the reasons that more and more uh, we as Aliander uh, take it as a requirement for the R&D activities we invest in that we require as, as uh, part of the uh, requirements of, of us funding those researches that the outcomes should be open access, should be able make an uh, open available. And if in these research uh, initiatives also include software, that these results are also made open source available in an open source licenses. And we see that this approach also helps universities to push uh, and stimulate open source adoption among their, their R&D activities. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'll, I'll go last here. My name is Natalie Vlatko. I'm an open source architect with the Cisco Open Source Program Office. Um, and I also work very closely with our um, internal group called Cisco Research, who are a really amazing group of researchers and fellows and engineers who are jumping into really state-of-the-art, cutting-edge stuff around cybersecurity, AI and machine learning, quantum computing. Um, and interestingly, being in the representative for enterprise, um, similar to a couple of things that Saeed had said um, around commercialization and wanting to make sure that we are investing in research that does, as a business, still talk to our bottom line of what we want to actually achieve and sell and grow in our business. But at the same time, um, there is a lot of um, power and strength in the academic approach of that openness of research and thus that partnership between research and open source for us comes very naturally. Um, I really liked the quote around a lot of small projects because hilariously our Cisco research group are just are celebrating their sixth open source project and counting <laughs> and, and that's something that they are, they're, they're really kind of proud of and, and we in the OSPO are also really proud to be able to kind of work with them. Um, because the one part about collaboration that I want to mention is that coming from a purely open source area and background and now working newly with research here in Cisco in my role, is that you find, especially as um, as an engineer um, or someone who works in open source a lot, as a side note, I work um, on the Kubernetes project as well as um, part of the documentation special interest group, if anyone is interested in, in uh, talking about that more, come and see me. But um, we often say, oh, you know, you need to foster community to get that collaboration going. You can't just put the code out there on the internet and expect that people are gonna come and use it and adopt it and, and improve it. There really needs to be that uh, investment in that community aspect. But what's very, very interesting on the research side and our collaboration is that we have found that they have come because the research community is quite small and really well connected in that when the research is permanent out there, it doesn't take long to spread and get that interest. And that's a really interesting thing that I would love to steal for just open source software in general that I think will take a long time for us to achieve. But that, that collaboration of using that open source model to be able to share research has been really, really awesome, especially for the projects that we're working on. Working on. And then if we think about on the funding side, we do partner with universities at Cisco to try and work together on a lot of papers and a lot of different kinds of research that yes, the big bad word of that, that is pertinent to our business, that is partly important. But what's also important is that we are open sourcing as much as possible so that we are taking advantage of that collaborative effort that open source can bring to that research. And one real cool area that we're doing this in, if we're speaking about funding, um, we've got this really cool project called ModelSmith that actually decompresses large language models and makes them more energy efficient because it's not just about funding around cost. It actually costs a lot of money to do a lot of this work. Um, and so even innovating in a way that is making the research more efficient is something that it may not be an end product, but it's so useful to all of our products on the enterprise side and so useful on the academic side that the only good thing to do would be to share that and make that grow and get that collaboration going. Um, so Cisco is really, really interested in keeping that up and at the same time learning from how research and academia collaborate in this great model that open source only wishes to emulate, really.
I think I can use this one. So um, I saw some questions here, but I also want to encourage you to share stories. Just just a quick question. Raise the hand those who came from enterprise industry related. Okay. And raise the hand the ones that come from academia. Okay. Yeah, so for, for the and uh, and raise the hands the ones that come from government, public sector. All right. So for those in public sector and for those in enterprise, uh, uh, this is open space. You can either write it here or we can pass the mic on saying like, what is the engagement or do you have any, any kind of engagement with academia at this point? Are you on the journey of, of having this kind of connections? Uh, is, you, you can just speak up or share also in the slide of stories. Yes, up to you. Uh, yeah. So I just make. Sorry. Uh, yeah, just make an observation that uh, it, it seems to me that. The reason why there are so many small projects is a PhD takes a year to learn something, then spends about six months doing it and then writes it up and then goes away and never does it again. So it's almost the, the real open source projects in universities come from two places. One is major infrastructure projects like supercomputing or something like that will drive it. Or the other will be there's a research group that you know, build some infrastructure and then their PhDs use that infrastructure. The big problem I see is sustaining of anything. Um, there's no money in sustaining, there's no papers in sustaining, uh, and particularly if it's being used by another university for something, uh, there's a real problem with support. Mm -hmm. I think you make a great point there. And one of the things I think we as enterprises can also take a role in there. So uh, one, of, one of the things we try, and we can still improve on that, but is, is if we invest in new R&D activities with academia, we, rather that these lead to new projects, we try to stimulate that we would like to see the results of the research uh, lead to improvements to, in existing projects. And I think uh, this helps eh, that making part of the funding and uh, requirement for the funding uh, that the results of research lead to improvements of existing projects rather than new projects makes it more sustainable and easier to maintain than every, uh, every research leading to its new projects, uh, which is another one uh, to maintain and to, to, to support. So I'm glad you didn't. Talk. I think sustainability is a very good. Uh, it's a real issue with, for example, big European Horizon Europe projects. They just fall off a cliff at the end, even if there is something commercial and they can't even pay to host it. But you didn't use the word valorization. If anybody uses the word valorization, <laughs> I hate this word. Because, you know, com you said commercialization. <laughs> it's commercial. Don't try to. Don't try to like wrap it up something soft and fluffy like valorization, which kind of means nothing in English. It's commercial. Yeah, you, you do raise a very good point. I'll, I'll say that one of the early conversations I had when it came to Carnegie Mellon was exactly this kind of project. And, and the researcher took it through the Apache Foundation, right? So there, there are pathways to do that for infrastructure level types of things. But as I've been there now over two years, I'm finding other projects that are in different categories. So there's a CS professor who's built a tool to make mathematical diagrams with very simple text, you know, inputs. That's not infrastructure at all, right? So it's not something he can take to an Apache foundation and say, let's, let's take this through the Apache way. Uh, and another is a project that is an optimization model for decarbonization. That's about as far as I can des describe it. But the Department of Energy is the potential customer in the U.S. So how do you interface with a different kind of customer, so to speak, or a very small, you know, application layer type of open source project that may have very widespread use. Um, and then, as you pointed out, there are these research cases where the community of researchers may be a hundred, you know, in, in, in the world. And it's great to hear that you are able to track that quickly. That's something I'll share back with, with CMU. I do want to add too on the commercialization part and the kind of influence on some of these projects. I don't think this is a hot take, but it might be. It's okay for projects to die. In fact, it's really, really good that they that they're sunset in a good way that we're telling the community actually there's no more resources or work on this. 
and we want you to direct your attention and possible interest elsewhere. That's something that even in open source, we're not good at doing that yet, let alone on the academic side. So I don't think that's necessarily bad. Um, and I think having that good, for lack of a better term, hygiene around projects is also something that I am personally really passionate about because it helps that collaborative part of, we are letting you, the community know, this is where our interests lie, this is where our now our um, resources are and where we want your resources, which is your time and effort, that is for us free to possibly use, um, kind of be directed. And I think we can get a bit better at helping each other realize, okay, what is our actual priorities here uh, when we're cross collaborating with industry and, 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 um, and, and uh, academia and so on. And what can maybe be the PhD project that now gets to live in an archive that people get to see as an example of maybe when they take on their PhD, how, how can it be done? That there is a really nice way to sunset those kinds of projects, I think. So since there are two questions, one more for academia and one more for enterprise, I think we can just ask to our panelists. Uh, so for, for, the, for the university, how do you secure staff for OSPO at university? Is it higher from outside or do you have a program to try an existing personnel? This comes from the academia OSPO. So, Claire might be able to answer this better than I can. Um, one of the interesting aspects of Curious is we are trying different models uh, for where the OSPO is situated within the university, um, where the people are being hired from. I spent most of my career in universities or academia, except for two years with the UN. But uh, for example, the George Washington University OSPO, the person who moved into that role had been in the private sector his whole life. So we are trying different types of models, different types of roles, different types of institutional homes for these OSPOs and seeing which of them may or may not be successful or what the challenges or benefits might be. Uh, we're very fortunate that this network and almost all of the OSPOs within the network have received initial funding from the uh, Sloan Foundation uh, based in, in the US. And the network itself actually has gotten funding from Sloan Foundation. But at CMU, we've actually migrated off of that grant funding. Uh, and the way that I had to do that was a lot of the things you've just heard, is making the case that this supports the university's mission in really critical ways. It's about industry engagement. Our university president actually put forward a task force to examine this particular issue. And faculty repeatedly said, how do we do open source in, you know, in this way? I'd like that knowledge transfer way of thinking of this because there's open source everywhere at Carnegie Mellon. So we're, we're looking at these as patterns. Um, Claire used to be the executive director of the InnerSource. Um, and we're coming up with these patterns and then we'll start to share them within the network, but then hopefully beyond that. Uh, but there's, there's no one specific way, I would say, at this point. Do you, do you want to add anything or? No. Yeah, I think it's like that same question could be asked about how do you hire people into knowledge transfer? And they usually come from technical background. I think there are two types of people in technology transfer, knowledge transfer, I suppose there are techie people and lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and people that want to be lawyers, frustrated lawyers. I'd regard myself as a frustrated techie, frustrated scientist. And you got to get that mix, you know, and it's a, it's a unique, it's like quite, how do people become patent attorneys? It's kind of the same thing. It's a strange breed of people and I can't figure out, you kind of just fall, you just fall into it. But our job is great. I, I love my job. You're meeting researchers. They're pouring out their heart about a project they've worked on for years, their baby that they've worked on, and they think it might be commercial. And you can never tell, you, can, you know, we all, you can never tell somebody they've got an ugly baby, no. you know. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? Very often you're wrong. You know, it actually turns out to be a beautiful baby. It's like what, it's like those clickbaits. <laughs> See this baby and identify the model from it. But anyway, yeah, it's, no, it's, it's, yeah, sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think maybe for the enterprise, I was trying to answer the first question that is about how can we determine the boundary between open source ready and interrupt intellectual property in the enterprise world yeah. or uh, I don't know who asked this question if someone wants to 
like better reframe or explain? Oh, I, I can answer it right oh. now. Okay, okay. Okay, there's this really magic word called copyright. That's the bound. Um, and I think, um, I am, first of all, I am not a lawyer, but I work with a few of these special breeds that you mentioned, Sean. Um, and, and, the, and, the, and the word is copyright there, where open source under an approved um, open source in, um, initiative license is absolutely something that we want to invest in and release. Um, but if it's our engineers at Cisco releasing this work, it will be copyright Cisco and its affiliates on the year that the project came out. And, and really that's, that's the difference around something that is this line between IP, intellectual property and open source. At the same time, uh, when we think about this idea of open source ready though, I think that's a really interesting concept in terms of even looking at any product that's open source or commercial. Uh, that really interesting idea of like 80-20, if you just keep working on it until it's perfect, you'll never get it out and it'll never get released. And then there's nothing for anyone who's contributing to really work on if everything is done and perfect and ready. That's that's kind of not, that's a bit of an antithesis on the open source side. Definitely in the Kubernetes project, um, side note. <laughs> um, but that, that line doesn't necessarily stop, at least on the enterprise side, from our engineers and researchers from releasing open source. Um, because at the same time, we also balance that with making sure that all of our contributors and engineers who are working as part of Cisco are doing so still as an individual. My GitHub handle is my own, um, and while my Cisco email address is affiliated with it, I won't lose it if I ever leave Cisco. It is still me, and all of my open source work will still be attributed to me, Natalie Vlatko, the individual. And so that's actually also a really strong case for saying, okay, Yes, there's this IP question around on the enterprise side where you're working, but actually the open source work that you're doing is still attributed to you and is still something that is going to follow you your entire career. Um, if you really, really care about the IP, then I am not a lawyer and you should talk to one. <laughs> I think you rephrased that very well. Maybe also one different perspective I want to give on IP is also the question, uh, where's the value for you as a company? Yeah? Often uh, it's seen as very valuable to have the full IP just for yourself. But the question is, 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 that, is that true? And we see for many of our innovation, innovation it's, it's, it's great that we are able to use that innovation internally and we have the freedom to do so how we want to. Uh, but it would be great that others can do too, because uh, often uh, the innovation is not ready when the research is finished. Often it's, it starts there. There's so much work to do and so much uh, investment uh, to come. And it is great that you are able to share that uh, and provide, get feedback from others in, in that journey and uh, open source and providing that IP also, uh, giving that IP also to others really enables that. So I'm afraid we are already out of time. Um, but I feel like this, this was like a starting point and introduction and I, I will leave this just one more minute because um, I think the idea from here is not just to stop this conversation but encourage people to start sharing their use cases, their challenges. <laughs> Maybe we can create a, a summary blog post of this conversation and let more people to to jump in and if you add your questions or your use cases or your stories here we're gonna track track those ones also uh when when doing this do you have some words no, i just wanted to add the blog post that you're mentioning it'll be on a little website that you might know called opensource.net that's where we're planning to mm. try and put this out really great initiative by the the osi to push a lot more work around a lot of projects out there so i just wanted to mention that, yep. that that's that's the plan to get this information out there for you all thank you so much so yep um thank you, thank you.